Now, amongst the subjects that spark passion in people, feral cats is right near the top. Uh, estimates are they kill 272 million birds annually in Australia. Uh, they take a truckload of native mammals too. And as you heard yesterday on this program, the WA government has assisted the fight against feral cats by declaring them official pests. Uh, one group leading the charge against feral cats and native wildlife protection is the Australian Wildlife Conservancy. Their chief scientist is Dr John Kanowski. Uh, John, good afternoon to you. G'day, Andrew. How are you? Yeah, good. Thank you very much. And John's prepared to take any questions on feral cats uh, and try and answer them if you've got any to fire at him. one three hundred five six zero 560 is the phone number. Now, first, your response to the WA government's declaration of feral cats as pests. Um, uh, what will this do, do you think? Well, I commend the WA government for taking this step. Uh, essentially, it just makes it uh, easier to... Um, for, for groups like us to, uh, to undertake sort of landscape scale control of feral cats. So we're doing it anyway, but this is, sets the sort of legislation regulatory framework. So, so, so when you on. say easier, how, how will it make it well, easier? Well, it's, um, for example, um, to do uh, baiting for cats. So the Western Australian government have been developing a, a, an effective uh, sort of like a sausage bait for cats. It uh, has 10 in it and... Um, to use that, uh, we have to jump through a number of hoops, and this particular uh, listing or regulation that they've passed will just it recognises that cats are a serious issue, and will help us, um, you know, adopt a appropriate contro- control strategy. Okay, now let's talk about your research. Now, amongst other things, you're looking into genetic modification. Tell us about that. Well, <laughs> that's um, that's the long shot. That's the silver bullet, and uh, that's um, work we're sort of. Uh, sort of exploring uh, in collaboration with CSIRO and universities and so on. And that's, uh, yeah, that's something, you know, that might come off in 10 or 20 years. It's, it's using some of these new genetic tools, uh, a thing called CRISPR-Cas9 that lets uh, geneticists very um, cleverly uh, change the genes of whatever animal they're working with. So they're working on malaria parasites and uh, there's some work trying to control uh, human genetic diseases. With feral cats, the idea is that it would just, um, when two animals are mated that had this uh, changed gene in them, that their offspring, offspring would be sterile. So it's a very, it would be, if it works, it would be a humane method of controlling feral cats, um, you know, at a big scale. But it's a long way away yet. So we've got to focus uh, before that on things that we do know that work. Okay. And uh, what are the, the top two there? Well, uh, unfortunately, really, the main thing you can do is to fence very large areas or uh, get islands. And we have an island in Shark Bay I'm going to on the weekend where 5,000 hectares, we've got rid of all the feral cats from that island. And as a result, we've been able to put four highly threatened mammals back on that island and they're doing very well. The other thing you could do, like at our Mount Gibson property in uh, the northern wheat belt there, we fenced off 8,000 hectares, that's 80 square kilometres. We've got rid of all the feral cats and the foxes and we're going to put 10 species of threatened mammal back in that area. So that's the, actually the world's biggest um, threatened mammal reintroduction program right here in WA. So what about unfenced areas though or, and not islands? Yeah. What, what, what's, what's, the, what's the best uh, solution other than yeah. that long shot of genetic modification? Well, um, it varies a little bit where you are. So in WA, uh, we're lucky in that... Um, there's a naturally occurring, this 1080 that you used to bait, it occurs naturally in some of the plants here. And so uh, 1080 baiting is reasonably effective in WA. It's not so effective elsewhere and the government is trying to develop uh, effective baits. Uh, so our research is essentially trying to figure out, uh, I guess, what feral cats are doing so that when we do have a, when they do refine this bait or some other method that we can apply it properly. And so we've been putting... Uh, satellite collars on feral cats and uh, tracking how far they move. Uh, they move some extraordinary distances like 170 kilometres, uh, 100 kilometres down to the Murray River and 100 kilometres back. Um, so your little moggy, exactly the same uh, animal as your pet cat, but one that lives in the wild, can move these extraordinary distances. So I guess what that means is it's no point just trying to control cats. Even in an area like AWC manages at Mount Gibson, that's 170,000 hectares. Uh, you could wipe out every feral cat in there and they'd just come in from outside. A uh, number of questions coming through. This from Sebastian. Interested in your viewpoint on this. Feral cats kill probably less native fauna than Parks and Wildlife does with their prescribed burns. What's your view on that? Uh, not really. So um, what we've found, we've done a lot of work on uh, burning in the Kimberley and uh, what we find is that feral cats sort of ignore the prescribed burning. That's the cooler burning. But if you don't do that prescribed burning, what you're going to get is a wildfire and that sort of wipes out the ground cover from large areas 
And what we found is that feral cats will move 10 to 30 kilometres to those big fire scars and hunt very effectively in them. So actually the prescribed burning is one of the few ways you can reduce the impact of feral cats at a landscape scale. Okay, and this, um, it's not just feral cats that are the problem, right? This person living on a three-quarter acre semi-bush block just five minutes from central Mandrill, where domestic cats cleaned up the blue wrens years ago. How much of a threat uh, do you rate domestic cats? Well, for sure. I mean, it, around towns and uh, so on, people really need who have cats, and I understand that. Cats are a lovely animal, but you need to be a responsible pet owner. So if you do release your cat and let it wander around, it will kill native animals. Um, this, uh, this is a bit uh, cryptic from my point of view, but Felixes uh, shoot 1080 darts at cats. Have you heard of Felixes? Yes, this is one of these interesting sort of developments. So a guy called John Reed, Dr. John Reed, has essentially made this sort of... Um, it sprays 1080 gel on a cat uh, and uh, cats groom themselves. And so the, it used to be called a grooming trap. So the idea is that uh, it recognises a cat and sprays this on it. It's a great idea, but um, it's still in the development phase. And, you'd, you know, realistically, for them to work, you'd need, you know, hundreds, thousands of them across the landscape. And uh, so, yeah, it's one of these sort of, you know, someone's come up with an idea, people are trying it out. Um, it's not, you know, it's not the silver bullet. Okay. Uh, let's go to Bob with a question. Hello, Bob. Uh, Good day, Andrew. And and your guest, John. Um, I think yeah, John. I think what he's doing, fencing off on that, is fantastic. Because if I could get rid of every cat around the place, I'd do it. I'm working on it, but um, I think that baiting and shooting. I shoot them, but uh, also the um, if they put a bounty on it, it's a Commonwealth government because they spread between states. If they put a bounty on feral cats. Even as little as, say, 50 cents, you'd be surprised how many people would go hunting for them for a quid, and that would put a huge hole in. Apparently it started in New- in northern Victoria with foxes, and the state government were paying, but it ends up they were coming from everywhere, hundreds of them. At, I think it was a dollar a fox or something, and it got too much. But if the Commonwealth paid for it, it would cost less than what the damage that these buggers are doing. Uh, the bounty system. Do you, do you think, or how much merit do you think that's got? Um, well, interestingly, um, some Aboriginal rangers in Central Australia were paid actually a pretty significant bounty to bring in feral cats, and it, it certainly motivates people. Um, what you can do is you can motivate people so well that they go and, uh, you know, uh, nick the neighbour's cat or whatever. So um, it actually is, you know... Th- the real trouble with that is it's extremely hard to um, kill enough of the cats. Like there's about two million or six million of them. Um, just finding them and to shoot them, it's it's a hell of a lot of work. Um, so we do shoot cats around our properties, and it's definitely worth doing that where you've got threatened animals. Um, some of these cats get a sort of search image for um, particular threatened species. Big male cats, for example, will often take out your bigger native mammals. So taking them out of the system is good. But, yeah, again, a bit too hard to implement across the nation. Okay. Uh, on bounties, Pete's rung through. Pete, what's your viewpoint on them? Yeah, I reckon, I reckon if you have everyone shooting jolly things, who knows how many people are going to get shot on the way. It's a safety aspect. Uh, a good point Pete makes. Uh, and on the text on the, uh, someone writes, the trouble with 1080 is it's non-selective. How much of a problem is that? Yes, that's true. Um, so uh, when, when uh, the cat baiting is pretty tightly regulated as to when and how you can do it, uh, for example, you can only do it in winter um, when the uh, you know the goannas and the bung arrows and so on aren't, aren't active. So, um, but yes, it is an issue. It will take out dingoes as well, and uh, for that reason, we would be very careful about where we'd use it. Okay, uh, we appreciate you coming on. A very interesting chat, and best of luck with all, all your projects uh, that you got going at the moment. Thanks, heaps, Andrew.